Hey, good evening to you. Mark's out of HurricaneTrack.com here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. It is Tuesday, December 17th, 2019. I have been traveling a lot lately. I uh, went up to New York and New Jersey last week and into the weekend to meet with Brent, our man down in the Virgin Islands, who is now our man in the Philippines. Well, he's back now, but he's going to be our Westpac typhoon hunter. And uh, we'll talk more about that as we get into next year. But he had a successful trek into the Westpac to intercept Typhoon Kamuri. And, of course, in the Philippines, area of responsibility, Typhoon Tisoy or Tasoy, however you say it. We're going to try to figure out how to pronounce these things for next time and be ahead of that game. Uh, so I'm back, and we have some off-season discussion topics to go over. I'll try to keep this fairly quick. Usually the updates each week, I do these weekly now. Once a week, unless we have a big ticket winter storm event to talk about, uh, these can be pretty lengthy since they're just once a week, but I'll try to kind of shorten it up and follow the old Shakespearean rule of something about brevity. It's all I remember. Keep it brief. It's all I remember from Shakespeare is keep it brief. And that's probably a few other things I remember, but that's all I can <laughs> remember for now. Okay, on to the weather. No active storms, currently no active storms anywhere around the globe. Tropical cyclone speaking and i think this says it best here tropical cyclones right there a satellite perspective this is a nice site the university of wisconsin site nothing going on anywhere around the globe for the time being so that's good news there so let's take a look at something that came out back on the 12th i think it was from dr phil klotzbach and his team uh, at colorado state university their qualitative discussion of the Atlantic Basin seasonal activity for next year. Next year already, 2020, coming up. And um, so this is just a kind of broad look at what they're thinking for next year. These are the sponsors that help make it possible. This is kind of like their patrons, sponsors, whatever you want to call it, people that help fund the project. Here's his abstract, etc. And these are the two main things that we look at. I think this is very apt that we show this. We look at the strength of the AMO and other things. That's the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. Sea surface temperature, positive, negatives, whatever, for the Atlantic Basin, as well as what's happening with the ENSO. How's the ENSO doing? And it's a really nice abstract and other descriptive uh, reading. And in fact, I will post a link to this PDF file in the description of today's video if you'd like to read it yourself. So the bottom line uh, for next year, the highest percentage right now, which is only 30% chance, is a fairly active season of an ace of 130. And that is that the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation stays above average because it is slightly average or above average now. And no El Nino occurs right now. That has the highest chance at only 30% because we're kind of far out, right? Yeah, we are. We're, it's December 17th here that I'm doing this update, so we got a ways to go. But that being said, there are some important puzzle pieces that we can look at, and Dr. Klotzbach outlines those very um, succinctly in this update. It's some technical reading, too, but this is the stuff that we can look at in the off season. And that's part of what I do each week. So we'll take a look at the state of the INSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. And we'll also look at sea surface temperatures, how much below or above average, or are they right at average. And these are all things that we can take a gander at each week because of technology and the tools available on the interwebs. And here we go, the NOAA NESDA Sea Surface Temperature Anomaly Map, this updated yesterday. And you notice a few things, first of all, Kind of a warm, neutral look to the, the to the INSO. Not really warmer than average, not colder than average. It kind of pans out so it's roughly neutral. Maybe slightly warmer than average, but certainly no overwhelming signal right now from the Pacific. In the Atlantic, subtropical Atlantic, way above where it should be, generally speaking, Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, warmer than they should be. Uh, whatever. I hate it what the way they should be. Says who, right? Longer term averages. That's what we're looking at here. So these are above the longer term averages. But this one area out in the, into the main development region, a little bit colder 
than average. However, this has my attention, this very warm uh, area to the south of the continent of Africa, south of the uh, Sahel region and the tropical equatorial Africa. There's the equator cutting right through there. So we'll watch and see how this pans out over time. Generally speaking, the models are suggesting um, a slightly warmer Atlantic and a slightly cooler Pacific. So I see where Dr. Klotzbach is giving a roughly 30% chance that next year's hurricane season for the Atlantic Basin would be fairly active. I, I certainly understand that. And when you compare it to this time last year, I mean, that's pretty, you know, the Atlantic was definitely cooler last year, and the Pacific was generally warmer, concentrated here in the equatorial region. So, you know, for what it's worth from last year to this year, year over year, uh, there is a little bit of a difference, but there's no overwhelming signal one way or the other just yet. Looking at the, uh, instead of looking at models, what do the models say? What do the models say? You really get lost in that sometimes. Look out and see what's going on. And this is the past. That's what all this is going by from early October, the end of October, November through December here. And we're looking at the subsurface of the equatorial Pacific. So here's the surface. Here's several hundred meters down. This is like a slice through the Pacific. And these are temperature anomalies in the equatorial Pacific. And you see it's pretty warm through the fall. But now that we're getting closer to winter, you know, there is growing, uh, there are growing areas of subsurface cold relative to average. And we'll just have to see how all that pans out. This is, again, something that we can watch. This is ebbing and flowing. You know, you see this warm blob over here trying to hold on. And then it kind of goes away there. You see how that migrates? These are those Kelvin waves that we talk about. There's another one trying to grow here in the West Pack. Uh, and then the animation finally stops like I wanted it to. So a decent amount of upper ocean warmth through here now, but also large islands, if you want to call them that, of subsurface uh, cold as well. So it's hard to say what, um, I don't know how I brought that up, Go away. Uh, what's going to happen next year? So we can watch and see how things are going now. That's what I like to do instead of worrying about all the different models. I mean, generally speaking, the modeling is suggesting neutral conditions on into 2020. But yeah, we'll see. It, it doesn't really matter in December. Hey, this is interesting, and it probably helped to spur the severe weather that we saw yesterday and today. Gulf of Mexico actual sea surface temperatures. All of this that I'm outlining in blue, 26 Celsius or higher, still, even in December here, all of that is still warm enough to support tropical cyclones. But since other factors come into play, strong upper level winds, pre-existing disturbances, etc., you don't really have tropical cyclones this time of year. But as we broaden the uh, scope out a little bit, that's a large area of the Gulf of Mexico that's still quite warm. And if we go and look, to, look back at the anomaly chart, most of the Gulf is running a little bit above the long-term average. How does that play into lower 48 weather? Well, you get cold air and fronts screaming out of Canada, subtropical jet coming across, scoops up all the moisture out of the very warm Caribbean and the Gulf. And in the middle, you get this battle zone that can set up and you can get some severe weather in the deep south. It can fuel some potent storm systems. So, you know, it kind of matters. It kind of shuts off hurricanes, all this westerly wind and other negative factors. But that very warm gulf, as uh, compared to average especially, does fuel some other storms that we can be on the lookout for. So if you go off of uh, Pensacola here and in your boat several hundred miles south, the water temperatures are uh, rather nice, but right along the shelf there, not so much. A little little chilly for my taste. Off the Atlantic seaboard, uh, the northeast, mid-Atlantic, chilly, chilly, chilly all through here, but warm in the Gulf Stream. And that's what we will be watching for. Will we get, especially one of those Miller B type storm systems that cuts across like this, something like that. The Miller A are the ones that come up uh, kind of a longer trajectory to them 
And once we spot something like that coming, I'm going to do a whole tutorial as I learn more about winter weather, and I'll explain that. A uh, good friend of mine, Tony Bright, meteorologist here in Wilmington, a uh, big winter, winter, winter weather fan he is. Uh, he and I have been discussing that as of late. Uh, Brent, our man in the VI, no interest in winter weather, and I understand that. He's going to be more of our typhoon. He's going to be kind of like our Jason Bourne, right? You're going to send the asset in, and he's going to deploy equipment in places that I can't get to. And we'll talk about it more as we get into next year, but we're really excited about what's happening. Uh, and we all learn a lot from it, and that's my point. And that's what I do in the off season. I continue to broaden my educational scope as well. And hey, real quick, for all of you oceanography, meteorology fans out there, a temperature gradient, the difference in temperature over distance, that's what we got here. So 26, 25 Celsius in the Gulf Stream, but just a few tens of miles to the west, water temperatures are almost single digits, getting close to it, Celsius. Uh, so lower 60s, upper 50s, over here near the shelf in the Pamlico Sound, out of the Gulf Stream, 77, 78, 79, even 80 degrees Fahrenheit off the coast of Charleston a good bit, but that is a temperature gradient. And the steeper the gradient, the more of these dark lines you see in here Kind of interesting, less of a temperature gradient up here. So there you go. And when you have a steep gradient in pressure, what we call isobars, when those are packed c uh, closely together, like you see these temperature gradient lines, these isotherms, lines of equal temperature, when you give a, a strong pressure gradient, it's windy. So there you go. All right, enough of the tropics, lower 48 weather, not too shabby, considering we're heading into almost winter time. A little stormy out in the Pacific Northwest, a little stormy in the Northeast, chilly down in Texas, that's what this is all about. But no major crippling, you know, Katie bar the door, news headline making massive winter storms. That being said, we did have the severe weather across the south here. Remember, certainly you've seen that on Twitter and elsewhere. Even the loss of life lately, unfortunately, so remember severe weather is a problem uh, 12 months out of the year. We don't just focus on hurricanes around here. And I'll be on the lookout for any big ticket items. Luckily, as we look forward in time on the Euro, uh, this is the lower 48, east coast, right? There's North Carolina, Florida, and beyond, west coast over here, the Baja. You got your bearings. There's your geography lesson for the day. Meteorology now, moving this out in time. Yeah, kind of trophy there, ridge over the uh, Rockies, but nothing major, no long-lasting longitudinal dips. It's kind of a mishmash. See that? Convoluted, you got some low pressure here, some troughing here, ridging here, but no, nothing that's locking in. We don't have one of those deep um, dips in the jet stream like that, a big deep trough with major ridging like out over the west. We're just not seeing that yet. It's fairly transient, a progressive pattern, but some upper level energy coming in here. That's what that green is. Lower heights in the atmosphere, that represents colder air, energy in the atmosphere, extra tropical cyclone energy, whatever. It's all there, and it's moving southeast, and it spurs a surface low, non-tropical, kind of windy and stormy, this is Sunday morning, by the way, coming up. So kind of a stormy pattern along the Gulf Coast, perhaps, for Sunday. And then that rides up. The Euro shows it probably pretty rainy here along the East Coast and Southeast. We'll look at this closer. Um, well, this will be Monday, so I guess we'll be talking about it next Monday. I try to do these updates either Monday or Tuesday of each week in the off season, And then notice, too, some maybe, maybe some storminess out west. Uh, there, I've hit that darn thing again. Sorry. I don't know why I keep doing that. Bobble, bobble fingers today, whatever. Um, and now we're at day seven, and whatever that is, trying to develop. A curious feature, if you had a, a strong dip in the jet stream, it could capture that if there was some really cold air, but that's not currently in play. And look at that, maybe some cold troughiness out west. That could spell some interesting weather approaching Christmas Eve. We'll see. That's still a week away, so we'll wait and see.
All right, I'm working on my podcast series that's on Patreon, and it's exclusively on Patreon. It is. It's one of the wonderful benefits of being a patron. Doesn't matter what level you are, you get access to this. Stories from the Hurricane Highway. Chapter 3 drops tomorrow night. I've already got two chapters on where we go back through my career and take a look at things uh, from an audio perspective. It's an audio podcast. So if you're interested in Patreon, that's one of the benefits you get. So check it out, patreon.com slash hurricane track. Real quick before I go, I showed this in a little movie trailer type thing that I put together the other day. This is some aerial video that Brent provided uh, from the Philippines, and this is remarkable. It really is. What are we looking at? All that smoke and haze, that is the aftermath of the typhoon. Typhoon Tisoy, um, that's them burning the vegetative debris. The power is out. You notice there's not a single light. Nothing's lit up. You don't see any street lights, anything like that. That's the Mayon Volcano. I think that's how you pronounce it. In the distance, quite a surreal scene. Huge thanks to Brent. Brent Lynn, our man in the Pacific, when it comes time, we will be expanding our operations into the Western Pacific more and more in large part thanks to our Patreon support. I mean, look at that, that smoke coming up. And, you know, as if you don't capture dramatic footage uh, of the typhoon itself, there's always the backstory of what's going on. And this captures that very well. Brent stayed several days after it was over, capturing the people, the places, the, ge the geographic impact. It's not just about that awesome footage that we all see and I know that that's exciting and that's what drives the views on social media. I get it. But boy, when you look at it from a cinematic perspective, coming into that old church there, and this is the Philippines with a freaking volcano in the background, you betcha. We're going to cover this more and more in the future. Big thanks to Brent for uh, spending the money that he did. He paid for it himself. One of our uh, Patreon sub uh, supporters, almost said subscriber, you subscribe to a magazine, you support creativity, and that's what Patreon is all about. But Brent went over and he took my direction uh, very well, set up a remote camera box, set up the pressure sensors, shot things like I would shoot them with various methods, the uh, quadcopter, drone, whatever you want to call it, the handheld gimbal stabilized video, it's called an Osmo and the GoPro motorcycle shots right on street level, showing the people and the places that the typhoon impacted. And we will tell that story in our upcoming series, also going to be on Patreon and on Amazon Prime Video in June, Patreon first, then Amazon Prime in June. And that's called The Hurricane Highway, a multi-part series that I'm working on for next year. So a lot of things going on in the off-season as we you know, get through the winter months. So there you go. Um, I think that's about it. And just a real, you know, real quick. There you go. That's it. Patreon, you know, it's kind of like we're building a community. We're building the support. But we're also building something that, frankly, is not available anywhere else in the world. And Brent, part of that. Uh, other people as well. Get rid of that. So that's it. Patreon. That's how we're doing this. And we thank you all for supporting it. And I thank you all for watching. I do appreciate it without you on the other side of that screen right there, whatever it might be, your iPhone, your tablet, your Android, even your Tesla. Remember, you can watch these on your Tesla, in your Tesla, I guess. If you watch it on your Tesla, that might be kind of weird, but you get the idea. All right, I am done. I am Mark Seth of HurricaneTrack.com. As always, thank you for watching. That's the most important part. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you again early next week.